Okay, here's just a little, we're going to go just a, you know, a little bit more into depth about uh, Germanic and the features of Germanic languages, features that English shares. So, um, first we're going to talk about Grimm's Law, which is the first Germanic sound shift. Proto-Indo-European voiceless stops, and what are voiceless stops? Remember, a stop is when this, this the sound is completely interrupted by your mouth. So, t, k, p. F, no, not f, that's continuant. F, you can keep doing it, it's not a stop. You have to actually stop the air completely for it to be a stop. In going from Proto Indo European to Germanic languages, voiceless stops like a p became a voiceless fricative, like f, or t becomes th. So, and, and sometimes voiced aspirated stops becomes d like the becomes a voice stop or a fricative, like the or the sometimes. So there's a chain shift. Sounds get pushed. So a v becomes b, becomes p, becomes f. So in from Latin to G Germanic, we can see p, pater, f, fater. Uh, the t as in, um, the d as in dent, the, ger the Latin word for tooth becomes t in Germanic. So dents, uh, dent, dent, like dentistry, becomes a uh, tooth or something like that. And then, so the t at the end of the word becomes a th. A g becomes a k becomes a h. We talked about that canis to hunt. You could also go from cannabis to hemp. Those are actually uh, related words. Um, and so also the... Uh, a qu becomes a hu, so that uh, in Romance languages we have uh, question words that begin with qua, qui, com, uh, quod, uh, quis in Latin, and these become in Germanic who, what, right? But those are, are cognate words. So these are regular sound changes that can be predicted. Um, Proto-Indo-European voiceless stops come change into voiceless fricatives. Pater becomes father, Pisces becomes fish, and so on and so forth. And the, these are this is Grimm's Law. Another feature of Germanic languages is that stress shifts, um, and uh, usually to the beginning of a sound. So we can see here undergo. Undertow, right? What's an on un, un, maybe we, if you're from Missouri and you've never been to the beach, you don't know what an undertow is, but it's when the there's a water that might uh, there's a current underneath the water that can pull you out to ocean. Watch out for the undertow. And what we say undergo, right? Notice the stress. And when we say stress, we mean the the syllable of a word that gets the most sort of emphasis, right? So undergo, undertow. Now, why is it that this is um, in the last syllable, and this is in the first syllable. Then we have outweigh versus outfielder. I'm, I, I'd, I'd like to play outfielder. No, it's outfielder. Uphold, uphold versus updraft. No, it's an updraft. So what's the difference between these three words where the stress comes on the last syllable and these three words, where the stress comes on the first syllable, that's right. These are all nouns, and these are verbs. And so the last syllable gets inflected, undergone, outweighed, upheld. All of these, there, because those last stress takes them, um, uh, the last syllable can be inflected. It, it keeps its stress, and these are just treated as, as pref prefixes. Whereas in these three words, well, you can get under toes, but that's not a lot. And, and when they're now, the stress shifts to the beginning. And this is um, something that, that happens a lot in English words. Um, now, of course, it depends on when they were borrowed, uh, but and also region. Um, I know in the, back in the East Coast, we say insurance, right? Um, keeping the stress on the first syllable of the root word. But I hear in Missouri people say, insurance, insurance. And that movement of the stress to the first syllable is a basic systematic feature of sound change in Germanic languages going back to the 
uh, the Bronze Age or earlier, probably. So, good job, Missouri. Um, so, the, yeah, in, in, this is called the Germanic accent shift. Final syllables are de-stressed and initial syllables are stressed. And that's of the root word, as we saw. Now, this will play a part in Werner's Law, which is discussed more um, in greater detail in that video. But and that what it does is explain exceptions to Grimm's Law. Um, you know, if, if, if something is regular, it has to follow a law. It has to follow a rule. So why are there exceptions? Well, the exceptions come into play when there's another rule that's overriding the first one. And so much phonology in linguistics is basically formulating the rules and figuring out the exceptions that, that to explain, to, to other rules to explain why the rules don't seem to work all the time. Now, remember our discussion in our inflectional morphology video of Latin, Amabo, Amabini. Um, Proto-Indo-European and many other Indo-European languages have a very, very rich uh, verbs inflection system. Uh, you know, Latin has two voices, four moods, and six tenses. One of the distinctive features of Germanic languages is they have relatively simplified verb systems compared to other IE languages, other Indo-European languages. Um, the Ger Germanic languages, and I want to make something very clear right now. When I say Germanic, I don't mean German. They're not the same thing. German is a modern language that is one of the Germanic languages. But when we say Germanic, we're talking about a group of languages that includes German, but also Dutch, Swedish, Norwegian, English, um, uh, Frisian, and various other languages, um, and, and uh, Danish, uh, and so on. Not Finnish, though. That, that's totally its own alien language. Um, and so the Germanic languages only have one voice, an active voice. There's no passive inflection, right? Remember, um, it has three moods, imperative, uh, indicative, and subjunctive. And it has only two formal tenses, the present and the preterite. There's no inflected future. There's no way of, of putting something on the end to make a future. And if you've studied French or you've studied Spanish, you've, you know that there are a lot of different um, endings to change, to inflect the, the tense and the mood of a verb. We only have a present and a preterite, right? And then sometimes we can form other tenses by using compound phrases. So in, in modern German and English, we at, we'll use the word have or will, and sometimes to change the, the uh, not just for tenses, but for moods, we can add words like should or could or might, right? And these, these change the mood of a verb. But there's only two ever two inflected uh, forms of a ver of a single verb in a Germanic language, and that's the present and the preterite. Um, there's only two inflected tenses, two formal tenses. Now then, what is a strong verb versus a weak verb? This is something that one of you wanted to know about, and I think there's something that uh, I asked about in the quiz, and so this needs explaining too. Basically, a strong verb is a verb where the stem changes in the past tense of the language and in the participle of the language. So I ride, I rode, I have ridden. I drive, I drove, I've driven. I rise, I rose, I have risen. All of these are um, uh, strong, what, and Grimm coined this term, that these were strong verbs. And I don't, I don't know why he coined, said that these are strong verbs. What's a weak verb? A weak verb is a, is a verb where you make a past with an alveolar stop at the end. Um, and in, in German, it's usually voiceless, like, uh, like you know, with a T in, in modern English, it, it depends on the, um, the final consonant, right? You know, I, I, uh, I looked, but I, hold on, chided, right? And then the D, it's a D at the end. It's voiced. It depends on what the final sound of the, of the root of the verb is. But that, anyway, the point is that a weak verb is made by adding that predictable ending of ud or d, you know. Um, sometimes you have common combinations like I sleep, I slept, right? But those are not common. Um, generally, 
a weak verb, uh, any new verb that you form in English is going to be a weak verb. It's going to form the past tense by adding a T at the end. So I email, I, you don't say I am old, you know, no one's going to like make up a new stem change. I emailed, you know, I telephone, I telephoned. I, um, let's say I, I Snapchat, I Snapchatted. Um, and one of you brought up text. I text, I texted. Now here's the thing, I, I, my theory about why sometimes people will say, I text him yesterday is because they hear that dental stop there already, that m, that the the d sound, and they and it and it registers as already being passed, rather and um, so then this is something that's actually been going that has been happening in a language since the 15th or 16th century. So that's that's not new. Um, but basically, the strong verbs you change the stem, the weak verbs you don't. Strong verbs are irregular. Strong verbs are unpredictable, and we're not making new ones. Every strong verb that we have is, is a leftover from a much older stage of the language. And this is a feature of all the other Germanic languages. In English, I nail, I nailed. You know, I nailed a thing in. A nagel, ich, ich nagel, ich nagelte. It's German. Nagle, naglede, Danish. Um, uh, there's theories as to where this comes from. Um, why, why, some, something, some think that at some point it was an agglutination of, of the, the word do or did gets like, I did, I nailed it, but, um, there's no, uh, there's no hard and fast theory. So that's the long and short of Germanic. Here's just a fun, we're going to do a little fun, uh, Grimm's Law exercise here. Remembering that, um, for every P, there's a F sound, that's a Greek phi. So in Proto-Indo-European, we have pods. In Latin, pedis. What's the English? Feet. Tritius, tertius. Well, the t let's see. Let's go back and look at that again. T becomes, that's a theta. Th. So tritius, tertius is third. Kun in in Proto-Indo-European, turned into canis in Latin, but it went a different direction in Germanic, and the k sound becomes a h and gives us hound. Now, decumt in Proto-Indo-European becomes, in Latin, decum. But for every d in Proto-Indo-European, there's a t in Germanic. And so what's decum or or, or decumpt, or decumpt, well, let's knock that out in the middle, and we get ten. Gel, or gelidus, well, that g also becomes, uh, what was that, what happens to that g? It becomes a k sound. Okay, so gel, gelidus, this turns into our word kalt in German, or cold in English. Guichwos, well, that's a weird one. We don't have a cognate for that in Latin, but that comes into English as quick. Richter in Proto-Indo-European in Proto-Indo-European becomes fratern in Latin, and in English, well, hmm, well, you might know this if you're in the Greek system, but fratern in Latin, that root. Let's remember that the f. Let's look for that f sound becomes a it sort of cycles back it's a chain shift so that uh, sound becomes a r sound and so this word is of course brother I and mean, you have you have an exercise to practice this yourself um, I hope this has been this brief run through uh, of uh, this deeper dive into Germanic has been helpful for you um, this shows some of the applications of the principle of regularity. I want to remind you that this is some of the difficult, most complex and technical stuff that we will do all semester. The difficulty in this class is front-loaded, um, so work your way through this with me. Try to understand it and uh, get at me with any questions, and hopefully we can um, uh, uh, lay a solid foundation for the work to come. Take it easy.